Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Erasmus Data Summit on Corona, Data and Beyond. Well, what I'm going to do is take you uh, through some slides explaining what and why data is very important in order to apply artificial intelligence uh, to find patterns and to get a better understanding of what's going on with the coronavirus, how does it work, and how can we fight the virus. So first of all, I have to explain the pathogen. The pathogen is indicated, as you see on the left, with an abbreviation, and it stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Type 2. There has been previously uh, other types of coronaviruses, and this one is indicated in this way. And the disease it's causing is indicated as COVID-19. Now, what we see on this dashboard, which is made by John Hopkins in the United States, that's a university which is accumulating data from all countries around the globe about the death and the contaminations. And basically this dashboard has been used since uh, early February to start monitoring how the virus is spreading around the globe. And at this stage today, you can see on the bottom of left is the date indicated. We have something top left uh, above 11 million confirmed tests, which are positive. And you see on the curve on the right that the virus is, is very much uh, spreading still and the curve is very steeply going up still. So there's more than uh, half a million deaths, as you can see globally, so this, we can speak about a serious pandemic. Now, what we see in this slide is basically the virus on the left and on the surface of the virus, it's like a crown. So that's why it's called uh, uh, coronavirus. And basically you can see on the right side of the slide previously, there have been other viruses described, uh, which could make the step from animals to human. And uh, other examples are MERS and SARS-CoV-1, and on the right is SARS-CoV-2. Now, what, why is capturing data on biology very important? And what kind of, what's, what's the relevance of open scientific data? The more data that gets accumulated scientifically, it should be accessible to scientists who wanna study biological processes and also medical uh, events. So collecting the data is one, uh, aggregating data is essential before you can start applying AI methods to discover patterns which are underneath the data. And one pattern you can see, for instance, on the map on the right is how the virus got into the Netherlands and has spread from the south more direction north. So the most intense area in Brabant, in the south part, that's where you saw initially early March, most of the uh, outbreak becoming apparent. This slide summarizes from one of the large European bioinformatics institutes, the different types of data, which are essential to study this COVID-19 disease. So the data types are listed in the column, first column on the left. You have genomic data, which captures information from, for instance, the DNA variants which are present in the virus. And also you can compare the different DNA strands from the different viruses to start detecting what does this virus most look like. And in order to do those comparisons, you can start to recognize that you're dealing with a coronavirus. Besides focusing on the virus, what was very essential in the early part of the outbreak, understanding what's going on in the host who gets infected by the virus is also very important because it became very rapidly apparent that many of the patients had problems in their lungs but why some people responded very severely and others didn't respond very severely or children even didn't get clearly sick, it's important to start understanding what's going on there. And also the Italian groups 
uh, have started sequencing the DNA of patients who were in their intensive care units, hospitalized, and the most severe cases, they started checking the DNA profiles of the host in order to see whether those DNA profiles of the host had specific variants which were more or less informative about why certain people ended up in the emergency uh, uh, ICU units or other patients didn't get hospitalized at all. Now, you see protein structure. So that's how the proteins, which are biochemically active in a cell, are folded, functional data, microscopy, microscopy data, which is very important for a pathologist who looks at tissue slices, chemical compounds. So if you want to make drugs, you need to understand how do the structures of the biochemical molecules actually bind to the protein structures of your target proteins where you want to interfere with. Of course, you need to have clinical data with follow-up of the patients, therapy response, if available, uh, vital uh, function data, et cetera. Epidemiological data tells something about how the virus is spreading. And of course, you want to monitor continuously the scientific literature. So those are very different data types. And basically, you want to suck it all in and be able to connect different data types and overlay them to start getting more and more information about what's going on. So the EBI is a knowledge repository, which is online available, and all bioinformaticians who study molecular biology uh, are very connected to this kind of sites in uh, Europe, as well as its equivalent sites in the United States from NCBI. Now, what we see here on the left is the lung, and actually what was very apparent that the COVID uh, disease was presenting very clearly in the lungs, and that was visible by making CT scans, on which it became apparent that those lungs had a white glow on their CT scan, and in the normal situation, you see, a, uh, you, you can basically see how the dark areas in the lungs, left and right, are present. Okay, so in this slide, you can start to see uh, pneumonia 1B and the more severely on the right damaged alveoli. Now what's happening in the green areas, that's the goblet cells in your alveoli. Basically those goblet cells, that's where the virus can bind on a human protein and that human protein was discovered somewhere end of March is, is indicated as ACE2 protein. And that's where the crown of the virus could connect to the goblet cell. Now that's very important to start knowing how can the virus enter the human body. And actually what's very interesting is that those green goblet cells, people who are smokers turn to have an induced rate, a higher rate than non-smokers for those goblet cells. So you expect that smokers uh, have a disadvantage because their lungs are damaged. However, it turns out that in this case, the more ACE2 receptor and the more goblet cells you have, uh, the fewer problems those folks have. It's very interesting. Anyway. Um, Complications like inflammation and blood clotting became apparent, and that's of course very important, and that became more and more visible the more diagnostics was done on those scans which were taken in the more developed countries. This is where you immediately see that collecting data globally is sometimes very biased for certain technologies that are in certain places available, and in other places not available. So you have to keep that in mind when looking at global data. And also in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the availability of the molecular diagnostic tests was clearly an issue in certain countries. So that causes a bias in data that is globally accumulated. And that's why it's sometimes not fair to compare the one country with the other country. And what we see interestingly in this slide, which was captured from the Dutch news and the uh, people from uh, Leiden University presented 
in a clockwise manner what's going on and the darker the lungs in the CT scans are clockwise so you go from uh, top left uh, to the right and and clockwise so you see the whiter the lungs get from the individual the worse it and the more apparent the disease is in the ICU uh, and patients presented with acute respiratory distress syndrome which is a clear presentation of uh, problems in the lung it's an acute problem and that acute problem seems to be triggered by a cytokine storm Cytokine storm is basically a trigger of your immune responses, which are going through the roof due to the invasion of the virus. So basically, that causes quite a lot of damage. Now, the radiologists make those CT scans. And actually, in the next slide, you see another type of data that comes from the pathologists. And basically, you see three tissue sections on the left very thin layers in normal lung where all the white holes are filled with air in a normal situation. Now, when you get diffuse alveolar damage, basically those walls are getting thicker and cells start growing there, which are not supposed to grow or proliferate. So you see that those walls get much thicker now, what's happening in the lungs are incredible amounts of tiny blood vessels, and there's a lot of air. And the air is with the fresh oxygen supposed to get into the small blood vessels. And that exchange is happening on that thin layer that you see in the normal situation, separated uh, by the in between of the green, two green arrows. Now, in the middle, you see the early phase of DAD, and on the right, you see the late phase. So the, the wall is getting incredibly much thicker. That means the exchange of oxygen is getting very, very, very hampered. And that's basically what is indicated with the ARDS and the progression of the disease. Now, those patients get in the ICU units put on a ventilator and you try to basically uh, provide the lung enough oxygen uh, to keep uh, the saturation up in the bloodstream in order to provide the rest of the body with enough oxygen. The protein sequence data. So the sequences are very, very long strings and you see a, more or less a, a, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, human protein sequence on the second row of this uh, alignment of the sequences. And then basically you see the pangolin and you see the sequences of the bat and from the civet cut, uh, scat. Now, initially, you want to know where is the virus coming from and where what does it most look like? And basically, <clears throat> those sequences were very similar to the pangolin, which you see the animal in the middle of this uh, picture. So the genomic patterns where we compare the sequences, as you see on the left, is basically done and collected in these huge data repositories. And comparing sequences is typically a very AI demanding uh, exercise, which is done by a molecular biologist in a routinely manner. Now, by comparing these strings of letters, you can also compare globally the strings of the letters of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that's basically visualized in that picture on the right-hand side. And if you look very carefully about, uh, so clockwise, uh, 20 minutes past four, you see China. And many of the lines are very, very close vicinity to each other. And that means they are very similar in terms of the letters that were detected by the DNA sequencer. Now, that basically means that the Chinese patients where the virus was first apparent were very look alike each other. And the longer the virus is in the human, basically this virus seems to mutate every one or two weeks. 
So that basically means that if you look over time, what this virus is doing, it's changing. And the distances in this picture in the tree, the closer you are, basically the more similar you are. So the more distant you get, you can see the virus is mutating and longer uh, away from the initial uh, start and trigger of the, of the pandemic. Now, what's very interesting, if you see, for instance, in the top part, you see Europe and you see Australia. And what's very interesting by comparing European uh, COVID sequences and Australian sequences, they were pretty lookalike. But that's very logical because people who got contaminated and went to Australia, they were flying mainly through London. And that was basically very likely the place at the airports where the first spreading and the connection to uh, Australia was via travelers, uh, which uh, went to the hub in, in London at Heathrow. So here you see another very interesting, uh, very complex picture on the left. And actually it has a yellow star, which says B is uh, at position 614 is changed into a G. Okay, we think that that change could potentially be a very, very important uh, change because actually uh, it seems that the virus which has the G is, is more infectious than the virus which uh, comprises of the D letter. And on the right, you can also see with the colors how the spreading of the virus globally took place with the different colors. Now we are going to focus at data which deals with the fatality rate. And if, if you actually see the ages at which the disease is presenting and causing problems and causing death, the death rate is the highest in the age blocks, which are separated by five years in this graph. And you see the older the people are, the higher the death rates are uh, in those individuals. Moreover, it turned out from Italian data, it became very clearly apparent that there is a bias for men versus female. It's not said that it's only men, of course, but there is clearly a bias. And that triggers biologists who are studying the mechanism of the disease to start looking what are potential biological processes which actually relate to both age and to gender. So we asked ourselves, can we link age and gender to a single biological process which the COVID virus could interfere with? And basically you see a picture here on the left and that shows the normal situation in a male and males are comprised of X and Y chromosome. And on the tip of the X and the Y is a similar region indicated in green and on the bottom of the Y and the X is a purple region, part two, and that's actually shared also with the same genes. So there is a green box and a purple box, and those genes reside on X and on Y. But the ones on Y are lookalikes of the ones which are present on the on the X chromosome. Now, why is this very important? Okay, a female has two, y uh, two X chromosomes. Usually one of the axes is inactivated, but males have a Y chromosome, but there have been studies published where the Y chromosome in elderly male actually get lost, and in particular in bone marrow. Now, if you look very careful, you see in the bottom part of the purple box, interleukin-9 receptor, IL-9R. Okay, if you're a molecular biologist and you understand all those gene functions and you can do all those lookups, of course, your databases are going to tell you that interleukin-9 receptor clearly links to SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency. Okay, so if you're elderly, you lose your Y chromosome. If you're young, you don't lose, males don't lose their Y chromosome. 
So that's why very likely the disease doesn't present in kids where you see it in elderly, elderly men, more increased leading into problems. So that's why we think this pseudo autosomal region somehow are important in the disease which is presenting as COVID-19. Other studies that have been done are focusing, this is in collaboration from, uh, with our friends in India, where small molecules are being tested and docked into proteins of the, the virus in order to hamper the interaction of the virus with the human uh, proteins in our normal cells. So Noscopin study, which was done in uh, Delhi with our friends uh, over there, uh, we are trying to write this up now. That's where actually also we found some small molecules which clearly inhibit a uh, protein clipping enzyme from the virus. So how fast was the virus spreading and how can we stop those viruses? What we see here is the death rate uh, starting uh, basically in the curve halfway of March and basically uh, the, the, the graphs which are on top of each other from the uh, national Dutch numbers. Basically, you can see the uh, diseased people which died per day, and that clearly reached the peak early April. And basically, below you can see the numbers of hospitalized people. And of course, by activating halfway of March a lockdown, the spread was more or less put on a halt. And basically that made uh, the situation so that the number of beds could be just sufficient for the severely affected patients in the Netherlands. So another thing becoming apparent from a dynamic graph is, is very important uh, to look at data over time. And what we see in this histogram-based presentation, 7% of the annual death are due to malaria, uh, malnutrition, homicide, Parkinson, uh, alcohol abuse, drugs, hepatitis, fires in the house, terrorism, natural disaster. And basically, this graph, what we see here, is a dynamic histogram. And in the bottom, you see COVID. And on the 1st of January, 2020, there were no COVID deaths in the Netherlands. Okay, the global death of COVID is monitored oh, in this uh, movie. And I'm now going to try to start this movie for you. And look very careful how fast, so look at the time on the date of January 1, 2020, and what COVID is going to do until May. And I'll start this movie for you. So you see basically the 4th, the 5th of January, and basically on 13, there was the first COVID patient, and it's gradually going up, and you see the numbers of patients who drown or get meningitis, uh, homicide, malnutrition, COVID is rising and has passed the number of deaths due to natural disaster now. We are on March 1 and basically you can see that very rapidly in March the numbers are increasing, it passed the terrorism, it passed poisonings, the fire and COVID is reaching very high up now and it passes malnutrition, it outperforms malaria. So the death rate of this virus is incredibly substantial compared to what normal death because of influenza, which are indicated in the purple bar in the more or less middle of this graph I visualized. So this graph runs till the 23rd of May. So what can we conclude from this? If there are these severe outbreaks, stay home, use mouth masks to stop spreading, and basically uh, don't 
uh, touch each other, keep distance of 1.5 meters, etc. What do we know for the future? This virus is not away at this stage. So it will keep changing and new ones will become apparent. If you want to read more about that, just Google another virus which potentially can cause similar type of outbreaks is Nipah virus. Check it in uh, Wikipedia. You can see that this virus is more or less uh, attacking the brain versus the COVID-19, what, what basically was more attacking the lung. So at this stage, of course, there's a lot of focus about developments of vaccines, but it's not clear which vaccine will work and also for what percentage of the population. It's very important uh, to realize that there are a couple of leads with big pharma companies who are making vaccines. Um, however, it's also apparent and more and more getting uh, clear that not all patients or people who get contaminated by this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus actually make antibodies against the virus. So that means that they potentially lose their immunity and can get the disease again. So it, therefore, it's also not clear to my opinion whether all vaccines will work for, it, for everybody. Anyway, with this, I would like to mention a couple of source references, which we have been using for our research in uh, our institute. So the EBI, of course, in Cambridge, UK, we use Google Scholar for all this literature and papers, scientific papers on COVID. Uh, John Hopkins with its uh, global monitor of how the pandemic is spreading, NCBI with the sequences of proteins and uh, genomes, including the, the phylogenetic comparisons, and of course the National Institutes uh, and Society from Intensive Care Clinicians and the Dutch uh, Healthcare Authorities, uh, RIVM. So with this, I think would like to open the floor for questions, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Anshul, I'm the moderator for this talk. So first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Speck for this very insightful presentation. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, you can drop them in the live chat function on the website. Uh, all right, so one question is, uh, there's been all this uh, data um, that's coming in, all this epidemiological data. Um, so how can we take all this data and make it more digestible to the common man? How can uh, someone who's not an expert maybe interpret this or how is it possible to make it easier for them to interpret this? It's very important that scientists actually aggregate the data and then for instance, make a portal like the guys at John Hopkins have done uh, where you saw the slide with the globe and every day they make a new picture you can actually stack those pictures behind each other and make a short movie out of it. Then you get a dynamic uh, flow of the changes in your particular data. So that, that's one of the approaches that is, is very easy to use. And uh, everything stuff on the, on the website is accessible with any phone or uh, mobile device or computer. So that, that would be my recommendation in this. Okay. So with this, I think we have to close this session because uh, our time is up. I would like to thank everybody for attending this uh, interesting AI uh, summit uh, organized by Erasmus. So have a nice day and stay safe. Thank you.